It's nice to have everybody here today. And if you're at home watching, thank you very much. I have been scheduled to speak since January, but the weather has not cooperated. And uh, so it's glad to be here today. Glad you're all here. And uh, my message is uh, something that you've heard probably before if you've heard any gospel messages. It's very simple, and it's two points. Man's ruin and God's remedy. And that's the simple gospel. The one verse we'd like to look at when we think about man's ruin is this verse in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. And years ago, our friend Josh Belvano was here at the Good News Center when we were down on Grant Avenue, and I remember him speaking from this verse. He said, this verse should be spoken in every gospel meeting because it contains the whole sum of why we need to be saved. Let's read it together. Therefore, even as through one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so that death passed on all men inasmuch as all have sinned. Romans 5 and 12. I'd like to just break this verse down a little bit and look at it in five different points. The one man, sin entered into the world, death by sin, death passed on all, and all have sinned. And with God's help, he'll show us why we need to be saved and why we need Christ as our Savior. One man. The very first man ever created was Adam. And the Bible says that God looked down and says, let us make man in our own image. You notice that it was plural. That was the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our own image. So they made Adam in the own image of God. And they made Adam with two arms and two legs and two ears and the same anatomy that we have today. But they made Adam with something that you can't see. They created Adam and God gave Adam a free will. It's the will to choose. Now, the company I work for, Cleveland Price, we have some amazing computer programmers. And we have some amazing programmers here today. I'm learning, I don't know a whole lot about you know, programming in the IT world, but I'm learning that the computer can only do what the program is designed to do. So sometimes when I'm working and I'll say, you know what, I, I want the program to do this. I'll have to go to a program and, hey, I, I need you to install this. Can you make it do this? And sure, we can do that. And next thing you know, boom, 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 there it is. And they pro God didn't program human beings to love God, to, to worship Him. To, we did not have that innate sense of, of falling down before Him and giving Him our praise. God didn't program us like that. He gave us the choice. Here you go. I want a relationship with you, and I want you to come to me, but I'm not going to force you to do it. I'm not going to make you do that. So Adam had a choice. And when faced with the choice, Adam chose to disobey God. Because God had told him, there's all this beautiful garden. There's just, there's just one tree you can't eat of. Just one. Everything else you can have. And you know the story. Here came the serpent. Deceived Eve. And Eve took the fruit and gave it to Adam. And here's Adam knowing that what he was about to do was disobeying God. But because he had a free will, he chose to sin. And that's how sin entered into the world. You know, 
recently, everyone was worried about Ebola because, you know, here was a disease and it was spreading from Western Africa and they were afraid it was going to go worldwide and people were dying. And any time that this happens, and any time there's an outbreak, what do they tell you to do? They go to the source. They go to the, 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 where it started and they contain it. They, they quarantine the people. Like if this is, this is ground zero as it were, this is the first, we're going we're gonna to cut you off so nobody else can have interaction because we don't want this to spread, because that would mean disaster for the whole world. Well, it's not like that with sin. There was no containing it, because Adam sinned, and Eve sinned. They disobeyed God. And every descendant of theirs, with one exception, sinned was born a sinner. We were born with sin in us. And that's how it has affected the whole world. It entered the whole world. It never has one man's decision affected so many. That one decision affected every single person who had set foot on this earth, including the Lord Jesus Christ. Not that he sinned, but it affected him because of sin. He had to come. And we're going to talk about that a little later. Death. Imagine a world without death. Can you? Can you imagine walking through the hospitals and every room is empty? No one, no one there that day for chemo. No one there getting radiation. No one in the emergency. Like, hospitals are empty. No death. No cemeteries, no funeral homes, nothing. That's what it was like. But when Adam chose to disobey God, and Adam chose to sin, what happened? You see, in, up to that point, Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, and they didn't have any clothes on. And when they ate of that fruit, when they sinned, they opened their eyes and they were ashamed. And what did they do? They hid. So here comes God, and God's calling out, Hey, where are you? What? Because they used to walk in the cool of the day. Adam and God had fellowship. They enjoyed each other's company, and they talked, and they, they enjoyed one another. But now, now because of sin, there was no longer that, that fellowship with God. Adam was hiding. And... Uh, God says, why are you doing this? What, what, we're all naked. Did you eat of the fruit? And it came out, well, you know, and it's almost like Adam blamed God. Well, you know, the woman that you gave me, you know, you gave me, if you hadn't given me this woman, that, that's almost, the, when you read Genesis chapter 3, that's almost the attitude you have. Because you gave me this woman and she, she led me to, no, Adam, you had a free will. You could have said no, but you sinned. So now, now, I need to clothe you. I need to put some, some covering on you. And we read that God covered them with skins of an animal. Now, let's just try to think about this. Let's imagine that uh, there's this animal there, and he says, you know, hey, you need skins? You know, Take mine. I'll be fine. I'm just going to keep here eating this grass and I don't need my skin. No, I wasn't like that. That animal had to die. That animal had to be killed and its skin taken from it to clothe Adam and Eve. Sin brought death. Sin brought death. And that's what we read. For the wages of sin is death. So here it was. Sin entered into the world by Adam, and now death was brought in the world. And now Adam and Eve were, were destined to die. Their life would, would someday come to an end. And not only their life, but everyone's life. You know, there are certain traits that you, we get from our parents. So 
Sometimes if, uh, if your parents are tall, then chances are that the kids may be tall. Sometimes if, uh, you know, the parents have blue eyes, maybe the kids will have blue eyes. Or sometimes if the parents are, are athletic or musical, sometimes those genes get, get traced down and the, the kids are the same way. Sin is 100% hereditary. Sometimes things like that skip a generation. Or maybe, you know, just because my, my dad is good at this doesn't mean I'm going to be good at that. Well, I can tell you and guarantee you this. Because your parents are sinners, you're a sinner. There's no exception. Absolutely no exception. This verse says, death passed on all. Each and every one of us have an appointment. You know, I've had appointments and I've missed them. I've been late. I've been early. Sometimes, you know, you just forget, oh, man, I... I had a dentist appointment, I forgot, and, and sometimes now they'll even charge you. If, you. if you don't call ahead of time, you're getting charged whether you were there or not. We all have an appointment with death. And we're not going to miss that appointment. Hebrews chapter 9 says, For as it is appointed unto man once to die, once to die, and after this, the judgment. We will all be judged after we die. And let me make no mistake. All have sinned. We all have sinned. No matter what you think, how good a person you think you are, you are a sinner. Why? Because your parents were sinners. Why? Because their parents were sinners. All the way back to Adam and Eve. Because of Adam's choice. Now sin has passed on all of us and death has passed on all of us and each and every one of us have an appointment with God someday to stand before God and answer for our sin. And we all have sin. We sin because we're sinners. There was a, uh, there was a movie called Sister Act 2 in which Whoopi Goldberg was talking to a woman who was a, she, she loved to sing. This girl had a beautiful voice, and uh, it was played by the, the singer Lauren Hill was the character, and uh, her mother didn't want her to sing, so her mother wouldn't let her sing in the choir. And Whoopi Goldberg was talking to this girl, and says, you know what, you're a singer. Because the first thing you think about when you wake up in the morning is singing. And the last thing you think about when you go to bed at night is singing. That makes you a singer, whether you're singing in the choir or not. You are a sinner because it's within us. And we can try to cover it up. We can try to act good. We can try to not misbehave or say bad things or do bad things. And we can try to do whatever we, you know, just inside. There is nothing good within us. The Bible says that. We are all as an unclean thing. That's what we are inside. That's our sin. And if we're all sinners, and we're all going to die, and we're all going to have to face God, um, and there's, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to us? A few weeks ago, there was a football game, the Super Bowl. Now, I'm preparing this message, actually. It was, the Super Bowl hadn't been played yet. But this gentleman, if you don't know who this is, his name is Russell Wilson. He's the quarterback for the Seattle Seahawks. And Russell Wilson is a person who is not ashamed of his faith in Jesus Christ. He is a believer. I've heard him in interviews. and He's outstanding. I just, he's one of my favorite players for that reason. But Russell Wilson, <clears throat> in recent weeks, has uh, drawn some fire uh, because of his um, association with a particular pastor in the Seattle area, a gentleman by the name of Mark Driscoll at the Mars Hill Church. And the people in Seattle are so upset because Russell Wilson will associate with this pastor, Mark Driscoll, and they're so upset because Mark Driscoll has the nerve 
to stand up in his church and say to people, if you are not a Christian, if you've never been born again, then you will cannot be in heaven. And the people in Seattle are upset about that. How dare he say that? You can't say that. How do you know who's going to be in heaven? That gentleman is preaching the truth from the word of God. And the people don't want to hear it because they're convicted. Because it's the truth. If you are in your sins and you die, the Bible says you cannot be in heaven. There's not one sin that will enter into heaven. There shall in no way enter into it, heaven, anything that defies, defiles, or making of an abomination or a lie. But only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life, Revelation 21 and 27. And you know, when I was growing up and I wasn't saved, I would cringe every time someone would take a platform like this and he would say, let's open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 21, or 20 rather, because this verse, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And if anyone was not found having been written in the book of life, he was cast into the lake of fire. That scared me to my soul. Because I knew as a young man, my name was not written in the Lamb's book of life because I had never had a time in my life when I trusted Christ as my Savior. And when I read that, my mind, my imagination would immediately try to think about how terrible it was. A place with eternal burning. And that's where I was going to be. Did I want to be there? No. And it wasn't until the very night I got saved I understood one thing. I deserved to be there. I deserved it. So, we've all sinned. No sin can enter into heaven. So then how does anyone get into heaven? I asked this question once to a man. I told him, I said, listen, Joe, everyone's a sinner no sin can be in heaven. How? What's heaven going to be? Well, he was kind of joking. Well, heaven's going to be pretty empty then, won't it? I said, no, you're missing the point. I have a good friend that I work with. His name is Jim. And uh, i kind of been on him pretty hard as of recent weeks because Jim always looks at the negative. It's always negative with him. The glass was always half empty. And I, I kept, I said, you know, listen, you're, you're a supervisor, you're a leader, you need to be positive. You need to, you know, that positiveness will, will come and, and the, the people that work under you will, will see it and it's just, a, you know, it'll grow. So I, Jim kind of came to my office uh, a few weeks ago and says, listen, I'm, I'm going to start being more positive. The reason I bring that up is to this point, in my message, it's been negative. Man's ruin. We are ruined by birth because we have been born in trespasses and sins. There's nothing we can do on our own. But God has a remedy for us. And the remedy is this. This is a true saying. And everyone should believe it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I was the worst of them all. This is the Apostle St. Paul talking. He's writing this letter to Timothy. He's telling Timothy, Timothy, of all the sinners, I was the worst. So we're going to look at God's remedy a little bit. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Look at this verse. He's eternal. What does that mean? He is eternal. That means that Jesus Christ never had a beginning. Think about that. He never had a beginning. He always was. Remember how he said that 
God said, let us make man in our own image. Us. That was the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Colossians chapter 1, this is what we read. For by him all were created. All things were created. In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the one who keeps the planets from flying out of orbit. He's the one that holds our breath in his hands. He is the one who is the giver of all life. That's him. That's Christ Jesus. And what did he do for us? He became a man. Remember me earlier saying that because of Adam's decision to sin, it affected everyone? Well, it affected the Lord Jesus Christ because he had to become a man to come into this world. He didn't come in to, to show us the right way to live. He did not come in to say, okay, you follow what I do and you will be in heaven. You can't do this, you can't do that, you have to do this, you have to do that. That's, was, that's not why he came. That's not why he came into this world. He came into this world to save sinners. I, uh, I recently almost lost a friend, and not because they did anything wrong, but because um, he was almost taken. He was almost in eternity. And my friend Scott, a friend of mine from Iowa, Scott Hayes, he and his wife were down in Mexico, and they were walking on the beach. And, uh, you know, just imagine yourself down there, join the beach. Wouldn't that be nice to, to walk on the beach right now in the nice sand, and you're in your bathing suit, and there's the ocean. And they came across a point where there was a, a river was, was emptying into the, the Pacific Ocean there. <clears throat> and the, the current was rather swift. So uh, Scott thought better of, you know, now we're not going to cross that. Scott, admittedly, you know, us flatlanders, we're not real good swimmers. So he says, nah. But there were a couple ladies that were walking towards he and his wife, and they crossed this little little channel area, and they said, oh, it's fine. You can get across. So against his better judgment, he uh, set out, and he, uh, after his second step, the sand under his foot gave way. And he was taken away from shore by that strong current. Now, uh, Scott said in his Facebook post, the average age of the people on the beach was about 70 years old. But there was one man who was a triathlete, very good shape, very strong swimmer. He jumped up. He saw Scott being taken away from the shore with a strong current. And he grabbed a child's life preserver and he ran. And he dove in the water and he swam out to Scott. But he couldn't pull him back in. The current was too strong. He was being swept away from shore, out into the ocean. Fifteen minutes passed. And Scott was going unconscious and conscious and Finally, there was a fishing boat that saw them and grabbed them and pulled them in. And Scott was coughing up water and blood, and he spent many days in the uh, in intensive care unit. And the doctor said, you were as close to death as you possibly could be. He was being swept away from shore and couldn't do anything about it. Just like we are in our sins. Because our sins are taking us away from God. And no matter how hard you try, no matter what you do, if you want to try to be good, you want to try to go to church, you want to try to pray, no matter what you want to do, nothing can get you back to where God is because of our sin. And some people try other things. Just like that man that reached him, he wasn't strong enough to bring him back. Just like people who want to say, you know what, I'm going to go to church every week. That's not enough to get you back to God. So you know what? I'm going to give one-tenth of my earnings. I'm going to give it to God. I'm going to give it to charity. That's not enough to get you back to God. 
There's only one thing that can get you back to God. One person. That's Christ Jesus. He came to save sinners. And to do that, he had to give his life on the cross. He had to go to the cross and allow himself to be crucified. The death of a, the death of a criminal, the death of a sinner, but yet he wasn't being punished for his own sin. I was thinking this morning, during our first meeting here, my mind went back to the very night that I got saved. I envisioned the cross and the words that Christ was speaking to me. And he says, I'm here for you. I'm here because of you. Your sins are nailing me to this cross. Your sins are holding me on this cross. And because my sins were placed upon Christ, he bore them willingly. I believe that. I believe it. I'm saved. I'm saved because of that. A lot of people have trouble with this portion. I'm the worst. You know, sometimes I've, I've, I've run into people who say, oh, you're one of those born-again Christians who think you're better than everybody else. Truthfully, anybody who's a born-again Christian will tell you flat out, oh, no, absolutely not. I'm the worst of sinners. Because the more we read our Bible, the more we understand one thing. I am so ungodly. I am so unlike God. Because I am a terrible sinner. Maybe you say, well, you know, Mr. Cluter, you don't, you don't say bad words, and you don't do this, and you don't do that. Within my heart, the sin that I was born with, and I thank God that my sin has been forgiven, past, present, and future, because of what Christ did on the cross. But I still struggle every day with sin. And this, this was spoken by the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul could say, and here's a man who gave his whole life, for, once he got saved, he became a Christian, to that point. To that point. Before we read in Acts chapter 9, he was, he was going after Christians and he was trying to kill them and he was standing by holding the coats while they were stoning Stephen and all he wanted to do was put these Christians in, in jail and see that they were punished because he was thinking he was doing what God wanted. And then he got saved and you can read about that wonderful happening on the Damascus Road. And then Paul suddenly became, Saul became Paul and Paul became a reacher of souls, a preacher who saw souls saved and churches planted. And he could still say, I am the worst of sinners. I'm the worst. Why did he say that? Because he knew his heart. He knew what was in his heart. And I know what's in my heart. Sin. And I thank God that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I know I'm a sinner. So what's that mean? Christ Jesus came into the world to save me. That's why he went to the cross, to save me and to save you. If you've never had that time in your life where you've understood that, it was for me, yes, all for me. I hope you have that today. And you can, because... It's being offered to you. Just like I said, man's ruin and God's remedy. And a remedy is only good if it's accepted and it's taken. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we can speak of a remedy. We're so thankful that we can tell about one, the Lord Jesus Christ, who loved us so much. He gave his life on the cross. We're so thankful that it was because of our sins that he went there and he bore them willingly in his own body. We're thankful for salvation. We pray today, Father, for those here who don't know Christ as their Savior, for those who are at home watching. We pray for them, Father. We ask, Lord, now that you would just be with our brother Will as he would open up thy word and 
uh, give him help as he would share with us a message from you. In our Savior's name, the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.